We are on. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and race fans everywhere. Welcome to this socially distanced edition of Burn and Rubber, which will be going out on YouTube and Anchor.fm in the coming days. Tonight is August 21st, 2020. I'm Sterling Siemens. I'm joined by my regular co-hosts, Hallie Stepp and Justin Palmer. Fellas, we're in different locations, kind of, but we're all in the same area of the state of Missouri for once. Uh, it is a uh, back-to-school or back-to-class weekend at the University of Missouri, and all of us will be back in classes starting Monday. And uh, Fellas, this is the last show, officially, the last show that we're going to be doing before we're back in our studio space next week. Um, how's everybody doing tonight? I'm doing good and ready to get back in there next Friday. New day. Well, not new day for here, but new day on the radio. Yeah, it'll be definitely great to get back in the studio. Oh, just everybody kind of just moving in, settling in down for a little bit. Um, hopefully, hey, not everything gets shut down before then, but it, it, we'll see how, how it goes. And uh, we got a lot to talk about. It is Indy 500 weekend. Man, does that feel weird to say in August? It's certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, it's certainly strange because uh, – with COVID throwing a wrench in everything, everything else has been jumbled up. But this is the Indy 500 weekend. The Indy 500, um, just for my own personal, it's my personal favorite race ever. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's glad to be back in the Columbia area. Uh, meanwhile, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started talking about the racing that happened this past weekend. We'll start with the NASCAR action at the Daytona Road Course, the historic Daytona road course weekend that NASCAR had uh, the Xfinity series had their race on Saturday. Uh, Austin Cindric won that event. There was some controversy afterward between Justin Allgaier and AJ Allmendinger when they made contact late in the going, but Austin Cindric, we, <laughs> how much can we talk about this guy? This is his, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, his fourth win of the season or hang on no it's his fifth his fifth he won his fourth race back at uh road america five wins this season for austin Cindric. that now ties him for the most wins this season with chase briscoe a fellow ford driver for Stuart haas um another race that happened <clears throat> the truck series had their race on sunday morning sheldon creed uh, for GMS Racing, got his second win of the year, and it is the first race of the Triple Truck Challenge that Gander RV and Outdoors is putting on for the Truck Series. Uh, so Sheldon Creed was able to collect the fifty thousand dollar bonus for the victory, um, and it, it was interesting in his post race interview because uh, uh, to put to kind of quote one of the Twitter one of the people I follow on Twitter, uh, mullets and bad language. What makes NASCAR great? Sheldon Creed had both of them. Um, maybe a small fine for that interview, but uh, well, who, who, who really cares? Sheldon Creed is great. That's the point. Two wins now, and it uh, puts him further in championship contention for the Truck Series title. Uh, going further down, ARCA had their race on Friday night at the Daytona Road Course. It was really interesting because there were thoughts that it, there were going to be that there was rain there. Uh, it was raining there at the Daytona road course and everyone was really tiptoeing around the circuit. However, Michael self ended up winning the race uh, after a pretty spirited battle with Ty Gibbs uh, just before the halfway break. And then Michael self was able to pull away from there. self uh, winning twice this year at Daytona. He won the, uh, uh, the season opener on the oval at Daytona. So that's something interesting to keep a note of. The Spanish Grand Prix, I mean, uh, what else do we expect, really? Lewis Hamilton dominated the race, led every lap, and won it. That's all we need to talk about there for now. Um, I'll get to the Indy 500 qualifying in just a little bit, but I'll go with uh, Chase Elliott, who uh, basically, it, it's clear now that Elliott is the road course master for NASCAR right now. Chase Elliott got his second win of the year. And it was on the historic Daytona road course, beating out Martin Truex Jr. to the stripe. It was, um, I mean, it was, a, it was an okay race, from my opinion. It wasn't too spectacular. I think maybe our expectations were a little too great for this event. But it, Denny Hamlin did say 
uh, in post race. It goes to show just how talented and how much in control the drivers that run the Cup Series are with their cars. Um, I'll go back to the 500 now. The Indy 500 qualifying trials were held last weekend on Sunday. And for the first time in 33 years, a man with the last name Andretti will be leading the field to the green flag. Marco Andretti in his, what will be his 15th Indianapolis 500, won the pole award. He will start uh, from the pole position for the greatest spectacle in racing, which will be this Sunday, August the 23rd. A uh, couple other races that happened today, as a matter of fact, when NASCAR is in Dover. ARCA East Series and the NASCAR Gander RV and Outdoors Truck Series held their races today. Uh, on the ARCA East side, Sam Mayer got the victory after Ty Gibbs, who led the most laps, lost the lead, and then cut a tire, putting him in the wall. Mayer cruised on to the win from there. And as for the truck race, Zane Smith gets his second career truck win and his second of the year, uh, beating out Matt Crafton and Brett Moffitt for the victory. And the playoff bubble for the trucks is tightening even further at the bottom. Todd Gilliland leads the uh, – he's four points to the good over Derek Krause right now for the final spot in the truck series playoffs. So now that we've gotten all that out the way, now that I've basically said all that, um, I'll start with Justin on this one. Your biggest key takeaways from uh, all of the racing that we saw this past weekend and even today. I will say this, I was definitely not expecting the way that race was going to go. I think we all anticipated a very um, crashy type of race. And I think the racing got, I think the racing and kind of got a little progressively worse throughout the weekend. I think obviously the Xfinity, they were the first ones on track and they, they were kind of the, what we expected out of the race on Sunday, we expected like, oh my gosh, these guys are, are struggling. There's no way they can keep this up. And I also think the rain from the previous night definitely helped that race because it made the grass as really, really chaotic. You could not shortcut that those corners in the uh, chicane on the back stretch. And by the time you got to the trucks and cup, you got uh, you had guys going through, through the dirt like it was nothing. It had no effect on the cars, and they were kind of able to shortcut at those corners. So it was definitely not a race I was expecting, but I was kind of glad that we had it. Of course, Mother Nature decided to um, tease us a bit because we were all wanting the rain. We got lightning instead, and which was very unfortunate because I think every single oh, NASCAR fan – who has not seen an Xfinity race, has wanted this for years now. Cuphead had the rain tires implemented back in, like, what, 2015? And we still can't have one race where we can set these guys out on the rain tires. There's for officially. It's kind of getting annoying at this point. But uh, Honda uh, for IndyCar, they were dominant in qualifying. They've been dominant in practice. They have brought their A game this week, and it looks like it is going to be a Honda um, a podium, if not maybe even a top five or top ten. And depending on how good, how good and how well the race can go for them, it is going to be a, their weekend, it feels like. And then what can we say about Lewis Hamilton? The guy's going to get 100 wins eventually. This is just another stepping stone and getting to that at – remarkable achievement obviously he passed up um schumacher for the most podiums of all time this weekend so big congrats to him on that and and then arca once again arca is very much struggling with the fact that they had a lower car count and that is definitely been in very um noticeable in their races and i think had they had more cars out onto the racetrack we will have seen a lot more chaos out of that ARCA race. Instead, we didn't get much, much out of that race. All right. I, I got to say that from the Cup road course race, it is the most historic moment in sports since the Vegas Golden Knights joined the NHL. How many times can we say historic? Um, I got to say it was it, that first turn when the race started, everyone had their hopes up going, are they going to make it? 
Are they gonna? And then they made it, and everyone's kind of like, "Oh, well, that's that's something." They made it. Uh, let's see, they made it through the first. Le- I made it through the. Fr- what is happening? I thought they weren't supposed to do it, but outside of that, it was honestly I kind of enjoyed the racing at most points. Um, there are some good battles in the top five until late in the race, and. I got to say, some of the tactics coming off of corners, you saw Jimmy Johnson would try to run on the apron as long as he could. It was interesting to see them trying different tactics to get speed. Um, I will say it was a tough race if you're a Kyle Busch fan, as most races have been, because I'm feeling bad at this point. He was locking up his tires early on, and it it destroyed his race, really. And it was also interesting seeing that Brad Keselowski did not believe in going through the chicane. I'm just going to go through the bus stop and stop right there. Okay, Brad, that's fair. (laughs) Um, It was a, I think it was good. It wasn't as chaotic as we expected. And that's honestly, sometimes we just have to accept that chaos isn't always going to happen, even when we expect it. Um, F1, what did I learn? Lewis Hamilton's really good, and so is Max Verstappen, and uh, Boatas' car is better than everybody else's, so he'll get third. What's new? Um, and the Andretti, Marco Andre winning the pole. That's a great story in itself, but it, I should have expected this because he had the speed in practice the whole time. So I'm not surprised in a little bit because he was being pointed out on a – many forums that his car was just really fast on the backstretch to the point where they thought it was 240. It was definitely not. I mean, we know those speedometers for NBC and Fox are not on point all the time, but he was really fast. So I'm excited to see how he performs in the Indy 500. Um, and really those are all my takeaways. Also Sheldon Creed, Thank you. I always enjoy that dose of personality we get in those post-race interviews. Gotta love it. Yep. Sheldon Creed, uh, just talking about his progress with GMS, man. I, I tear up a lot of bleep. <laughs> Not going to say it out loud, but, uh, but you get the picture. But <clears throat> as I was going to say for the, uh, the Daytona road course, definitely, I think we had expectations it was going to be more like the Charlotte Roval. Uh, considering how it was a, it was for some drivers a completely new element. I think if anything lived up close to what we had expected, it was the Xfinity race, because that that was pretty chaotic. Um, I, I there was one moment that sticks out when you had both Mike Harmon racing cars leading the field down in the first corner, and they're all locking up. Both of them are locking up. They're doing what Brad K. let did at the Charlotte Roval a few years ago, or a couple of years ago, leading the Army off the cliff. And they, I think they were even seven wide going through turn one, which was – I mean, that's great. That's great. Just that snapshot there is fantastic. But, um, but there are some – I mean, the, the race itself it, – in my mind, it could have been better. Kyle Busch had a good race going for all of like a lap and a quarter, and then things fell apart from there. The defending champ, just for the life of him, he cannot catch a break this year. And it got worse when he blew a tire and just had more issues. I think he, in fact, if I remember correctly, his crash was the only one that brought out a caution during the cup race on Sunday. Yep. Yeah, he, uh, Kyle Busch's season is just – it's taking a nosedive. He's still got a lot of points, though. He just doesn't have a win. That's something we're accustomed to seeing from Kyle Busch in recent years. Um, uh, Sheldon Green and Austin Sindrick, both of them are actually really good road course racers, and it, uh, it's not too surprising to see them win. Chase Elliott, I mean, what more is there to say? He's kind of like Austin Sindrick to the Cup Series. Um Chase Elliott is just that good on the road courses, it seems. And I don't know if there's any stopping him. It, uh, he's going to be a threat at the Charlotte Roval again. I mean, let's just say that now. Um, what else is there? Lewis Hamilton winning the Spanish GP, not really too surprising. I thought Max Verstappen could give him a run for his money. Verstappen did run really well, but Hamilton's just so, so good. Practically unbeatable. Um Dover, we saw a couple races today. Um, uh, both of them were kind of rather forgettable, but uh, Zane Smith did get his second win. Congrats to Smith on that. And congrats to Sam Mayer for the ARCA East win. 
it's going to be interesting because this upcoming weekend there's going to be two double headers one xfinity race and or one xfinity race and one cup race for both saturday and sunday each uh two races each for both series it'll be interesting to watch but the indy 500 qualifying i called it i called that marco andretti was going to win the pole award for this race and look what happened i am an oracle gentlemen i called it now i'm kidding i'm not i'm not like a wizard like that but still it's great to see marco andretti win the pole uh considering how his indycar career has gone which i mean He's got, he drives for technically his father's team, but it's also in conjunction with Brian Herta, Autosport, and the Curb Agajanian operation. Um, Marco Andretti's career on paper doesn't look too remarkable. But all of that can be forgotten if he wins the Indy 500. All of that can be forgotten. He's been racing full-time since 2006. He only has two wins to his name. The last uh, IndyCar win he got, Iowa in 2011. It's been almost a decade since Marco Andretti won in the IndyCar series. He is due for something to happen. Due for something big to happen. Uh, I'll just, I'll say that much. And Honda domination is, it's real. Honda is going to be a force to be reckoned with uh, for the Indy 500. I'm surprised at how slow Team Penske was. Um, We'll go through the starting grid. We'll go further in depth on the Indy 500 later, but Um, Yeah, there's just Chevy really uh, struggling. I think the fastest driver for Chevy was Renus VK, and he's the highest qualifying rookie in fourth. But some other guys I want to talk about just real briefly. Um, Guys who had some really good runs this last weekend. Rafael Lassard in the truck series. He's been a very anonymous rookie. He's had a very quiet rookie season. Nothing spectacular. Nothing incredibly disappointing, but given he's in KBM equipment, we did kind of expect more out of him. A third place run at, here at the Daytona Road Course, exactly what he needed. Absolutely what Lassard needed. Um, hopefully he's able to capitalize off of that uh, as the season goes on. Looking further down, Parker Kligerman driving for Henderson Motorsports, the Food Country USA team, gets a top 10. Scott Legacy Jr., we haven't seen him in NASCAR in a while, it seems. He gets a top 10 driving for On Point Motorsports. Um, further down the list, um, let's just let's look at some other races that happened over on the Xfinity side. Andy Lally, um, two races in the Hour Motorsports O2 car, two top fives. <laughs> uh, talk about consistent. Andy Lally, I'm surprised m- m- – I'm surprised that uh, more teams don't call on him for their road course races, but then again, they do have their full-time guys. But Andy Lally, he's he's run a full NASCAR schedule before. Just look at his days with uh, TRG Motorsports in 2011. He's done it, and he's a very talented road course racer. Uh, further down, Jeremy Clemens got a top 10. He's in sixth. Uh, for the cup race, Chris Busher. That's something that uh, Chris Busher – he, we expect him to get some good runs, but this season, considering how disappointing it's been for Roush Fenway, it's good to see Chris Buescher get a top five. Uh, it's something that that 17 team really, really needed. But I do want to talk about uh, – actually, I'll save him for later. Michael McDowell, top ten for front row. I mean, we know McDowell comes from a road racing background, and he showed why. He showed how good he is on the road courses with a top ten. A 10th place finish for Front Row Motorsports. But I want to – He was, like, I, top five. He was top five before that caution. And yeah. keep in mind, so, uh, mm-hmm. uh, once again, Michael McDowell, one of the most underrated road course drivers out there. He's – this was definitely his chance. And what's even scarier is Daytona's coming up, and, up, and that's also going to be a Michael McDowell type of track. Yep. Um. I do want to talk also mention uh, Bubba Wallace, even though he finished 25th, he was running up in the top 10 late in the going. And on the last lap, Joey Logano, uh, I'll be honest, I don't know where Logano was going on that, on that first corner, but he tried to do a dive bomb, ended up getting into Alex Bowman, and then Bowman got into Bubba, and Bubba went from ninth at, or eighth, somewhere around there, late in top 10. He went from inside the top 10 to 25th. So uh, that's unfortunate. That was the debut race for DoorDash on the 43 car, but they're going to be on the car a few more times 
as the season goes on. I do want to focus on Kaz Grala, though. Kaz Grala finished seventh on debut in the Cup Series. It's his Cup debut, gets a top ten. He was driving in place for Austin Dillon, who um, – and we didn't talk about this on the show last Friday because it broke the day after. Austin Cindric – or not Cindric, excuse me, Austin Dillon – was diagnosed with COVID-19, tested positive for it. Now, Kaz Grala was basically a late substitution right in the middle of it saying, hey, you're going to be in this car now. Uh, good luck. And Kaz Grala, who uh, we don't talk about much, but he does come from a road racing background. He, he did win the truck race at Daytona in 2017 and was going to win Canada, but then Austin Sindrick decided to be like Tanya Harding for um, a lap or two. Um, uh, Kaz Grala then uh, got got in the three car and really just ran solid the whole race. Got a top ten finish out of it. Um, and Grala he drives part time for RCR in the Xfinity series. Um, in the back of my mind, uh, like the fan part of me th- is wanting to say, give Kaz a full time ride somewhere. He can drive. Trust me, he can drive. So those are the guys I wanted to spotlight out of this whole thing. Uh, let's go ahead real quick and do a gas and go segment or just go section by section. Uh, these first few questions are pretty related to the Daytona road course, Daytona uh, infield road course in general. So just to make it super quick, um, well, I'll, I'll give the provision, stay as close to one word as possible. So we'll just go ahead and make that. Um, let's go ahead I'll start with Hal Lee's step on this first question. Yes or no, would you prefer the Daytona road course over Road America? No. Justin? No. Okay. I wouldn't either. Daytona road course over Indianapolis, Hal. Yes or no? Oval or road course? Uh, let's say road course. No. All right. Justin? Uh, with a full field, yes, but uh, no. No. Uh, I would not, I mean, with kind of like how it is, is it's in Indy's background, this is NASCAR's Earth's track, I would say a, a yes, actually, to this. All right. Uh, how about, uh, let's, let's try this different one. Uh, starting with Hal again, just to uh, substitute uh, one that I'm adding in, the Daytona Road Course over the IMS Oval, yes or no? Yes, and that destroys all tradition, and I recognize that, but I'm a fan of an entertaining race. <laughs> all right, Justin. Uh, I'll stick with the crown jewel on this one, though. Yeah, uh, I, I tend to actually like the IMS Speedway, even though races aren't the most entertaining. Um, st- still keep the IMS Oval. Uh, Daytona Road Course to replace the Coke Zero 400 at Daytona. Yes or no? No. Just. No. Yeah, you'd be crazy to replace this, I think. The Coke Zero 400, let's be honest, even though it's not 4th of July weekend anymore, it should be, uh, please don't get rid of it. Please, please, please don't get rid of it. Uh, Next question to talk about. Hal, should the Daytona road course be the – well, it's going to be the side of the clash next year. Um, It's already been confirmed. Uh, Should it continue to be like that after next year? I'm going to say yes on that because um, I just – we know we don't like the clash in its current form or past form because it turns into the whole train. You don't get, really get that on a road course. If it turns into that, that's a problem. Here's what I'm going to say, and this is going to oh, raise some alarms. I don't think the clash – I think it's time to retire the clash. I really don't see this being a substitute for the clash. It, it's not going to work um, – you look at the ARCA race, it's the reason why this, I mean, the, it, let's be honest, this is a good race. This was a good race. It wasn't the race we were expecting, but it was a good race. There were a ton of passing opportunities. It's, there was action all around, even though there wasn't a caution. I don't think you're going to have that. And, and again, if you were to go back there, I think you would have a lot more cautions. And it's just because of, you know, um, the, just the nature of racing. I think somehow we got uh, um, all the flavor taken out of this race. It was still a good race. It was basically vanilla uh, ice cream and was what it was. 
as you were expecting in the full Sunday and you got vanilla ice cream, but it's still ice cream. It was good. Oh, but man. don't be dog and vanilla like that. I actually like I'm it. not dog. <laughs> <laughs> but but you're getting what I'm you're trying to see where I'm going with this. But here's the deal. The reason why I think it was able to work, Eric, and the reason why you had so many passing opportunities was because there were 40 cars in the field. You're not going to have 40 cars in the field for the class. You're going to have 18, 16, maybe a 20 at most. You're severely limiting your passing. You're, you're severely taking out the chaos factor of what can happen during turn one. I just don't see this being a replacement to you know, Daytona, like the oval. And the Daytona oval is horrible in itself. I think it's time to get rid of the clash because I don't see an alternative that would really just help this out. Uh, I think the clash is kind of an old relic because qualifying, and I'll be honest, qualifying isn't as big as it used to be. We've seen that kind of this year. I just don't see the clash having a purpose anymore in the cup series. I think the clash can still be done, but I would make some pretty radical changes to it. Uh, not put it on the road course. Um, I think it's a good idea to at least give it a shot, but I feel like with just this one year, it's not going to do that well, I'm afraid. Well, here's my suggestion. Keep it on the super speedway, the two and a half miles oval. What you do, make, instead of it being 75 laps, which is way, way, way too long for just a race for fun, make it 10 laps. And then on top of that, uh, have the carrot of, Hey, whoever gets the stripe first wins $50,000. You want 50 grand? I know you want it. Now get over here and race like you want it. That would put on a great show. Tell that to the team owners or, or, or how about a more or, or stupid idea? How about we take the restrictor plates off just for one race? Well, I don't think they have restrictor plates anymore, do they? They got rid of them, I think. Or, or, tapered, or tapered spacers, whatever you're doing. Hey, just take it out. Let these guys go wild. Oh, yeah. I would look. I would like. You're not gonna have pack racing, and you're not gonna have these these big collisions. And I would. I would almost say, take them. Oh, oh, the light just went off here. But and uh, take a chance on it. And go ahead and and see what they can do on it on the track without the restrictor plates, just for one race. I would not mind seeing that if they deemed it safe. If they deemed it safe, which I'm not just sure. a big key or, or better yet, better yet. If we're going to be really wild and crazy, let's have uh, everyone run five laps the correct way, then five laps the opposite direction. And then with five to go, we'll split the field half, go one way, half, go the other. All right, I, Tully Stewart. You're really talking to the WWE fan in me right now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Last car standing wins 50 grand. That's how you do it. I'm Tell kidding. that to the I'm team owners. <laughs> Oh, one can dream. One can dream. Let's, uh, I did skip over this question. Let's talk about it. Hal, back to you on this one. Two Robles a year, would you buy or sell the concept? I would sell it. I don't want, the indie, the indie one really kind of makes me want to say yes, but I just don't want two Robles. It takes away from what makes the Charlotte Robles special. Yeah, I kind of got to sell on that too. Oh, as much as I would love to have Indy or Daytona on there, or it's just, I just cannot work in the 36X race format. Obviously, you could take tracks out. You could put, uh, you can get rid of a race at Michigan. You can get rid of a race at Pocono. You can get rid of a race at Kansas. It's no offense to you, Kansas. I mean, you local Kansas City guys. It's, but, you just can't do – I just don't see a way you can do two Robles a year or without, you know, making – without taking away the speciality of um, the Roval in Charlotte. And so I – yeah, I'm in the same boat as how I, I would kind of want to see a, a Indy or Daytona, but I just don't feel it's right under a 30 race – I mean the 36 race schedule. Yeah, under 36 races would be difficult. And uh, don't be taking away any Kansas races. I love those races. <laughs> it is my track. I'm a little biased. But 
Um, but I feel like in the future, if this keeps going on, uh, when you have a, a race at the Charlotte Roval is really good. Oh, wait, the IMS road course race was actually pretty good. Oh, what about the Daytona road course? We got this, 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 and this. Here's what I'm thinking. Maybe just years down the line, years planning, this could go something along the lines of what uh, some Formula One Grand Prix have done in the past, such as in Germany or what was originally going to happen with Spain. You alternate the venue of a certain event. Say, let's say they do the Charlotte Roval one year, and then the next year they go IMS road course. And the year after that, maybe Daytona road course. Then it goes back to Charlotte uh, for uh, the year after that. Because uh, it's kind of applied with Formula One when the German Grand Prix for a long time where they did the Nürburgring one year and then the Hockenheim ring the next year, then went back to Nürburgring and go Nürburgring, Hocken, Nürburgring, Hocken, uh, just back and forth. And with Spain, they were going to do that uh, with uh, uh, Catalonia and Valencia, the street circuit, but Valencia closed down. So that put that plan out to pasture. Um, but uh, just something like that. I think that's something that could be tossed around in the future. I don't know if it's gonna happen next year at least. But uh, it's something to think about. Because don't get me wrong, the Roval races are entertaining. But at the same time, I would like a genuine road course like Road America or Mid-Ohio or even Road Atlanta. Uh, something like that. Um, or even a street race if NASCAR is, is that adventurous, which I don't know if they are. I don't think they are. But Heck, let's add one in the north. I mean, the northwest side of the country. What about Portland? Portland, yeah. yeah. Portland, and I mean, I would love to see the trucks go back there, or or even the Xfinity. It would, it would definitely be interesting. But I just cannot put two Rovals in out of the kindness of my heart without out uh, seeing in Road America, Road Atlanta, even in Mid Ohio. Just any of those road courses that have have definitely earned their place on the NASCAR schedule. Canadian Tire that has been a fantastic racetrack. Heck, I I cannot I'd say with a good and heart that the Indianapolis road course or Daytona, despite how good those races are, and again, I'm not, not, not discounting the, how good those races have been, but I would not take it over our Canadian Tire. Canadian Tire has been a proven commodity in the Truck Series, and I would love uh, for or the Cup Series or the Xfinity Series to go to oh, these road courses and just have a ball with them. However, I will say I do not want to have more than and seven road courses in the NASCAR schedule. I think that's kind of, of where I got to draw the line after six. Yeah, it's pushing it around that time. A um, couple more questions to get to. I'll start with Hal again on this one. Yes or no, Hendrick Motorsports will have three cars in the playoffs. I'm going to say yes, because I feel like whoever wins the Daytona race, I know it's an incredibly dumb thing to make a prediction about that. They're going to already have a win or be in the playoffs. I feel like there's a good shot at that. And it's between William Byron and Jimmy Johnson for that last spot. So unless there is a great push from Eric Jones, I think he'll, they'll be okay to get three in. I think they'll get at three in. I'm just not sure. Or ha the way they get three in, I think, is a little bit different. Because keep in mind, Dover is a Hendrick track. So oh, it, if there's any week, and I mean any week, where or the Hendrick curses of William Byron or Jimmy Johnson would come to an end, it would have to be at Dover. And I'm buying into the fact that they will have at least – three cars in the playoffs when we get started in Las Vegas or Richmond. No, I'm yeah. sorry. It's Darlington. <laughs> yeah. They started Darlington this year. Um, I feel like there's going to be three cars. It's just a matter of it, whether or not it's Byron or Johnson. Uh, right now I'm kind of leaning toward Johnson. Uh, I'll, it's kind of superstitious. Uh, I will admit, but, but Alex Bowman's already locked in with his California win and Chase Elliott's got two wins now. So he's definitely in there. Um, who gets the third spot for Hendrick in the playoffs uh, if they make it, which uh, right now I'm really heavily considering that uh, leaning toward the fact that one of them will make it. Uh, the next couple of weeks will be the determining factor next few weeks, actually, because we'll have the, the two races at Dover and then we'll have the 
uh, Daytona crapshoot on August 30th, uh, August 29th. So good luck, everybody. Um, let's see. Last, last question to get to. We'll start again with Hal for this one. Will Team Penske get a car inside the um, – I, I, okay, probably need to clarify on this. Will Penske get a car inside the top five this weekend? I would assume this is for the Cup Series points. Indy 500. Indy 500, excuse me. Uh, Team Penske, will they get a car in the top five for the 500? I was about to roast Joey Logano on this one, but I guess <laughs> I'll go ahead. And, I would say uh, – I'm going to say no because they just have not had the speed so far, and this isn't something that just came out of nowhere. I believe one of the drivers had been complaining about it beforehand, so unless they get that fixed, I don't believe they're going to get in the top five. Unless this race turns into a wreck fest, in which case somehow, some way, a, into a, I mean, a, let's say, put it this way, a, if James Davidson gets into the top 10 and because the race is that big of a wreck fest, then yes, Penske will get a top five. However, or I do not see a, any a big wreck fest happening. I don't see James Davidson getting in the top 10 this weekend, and I do not see a, a Penske pulling out a top five at their home track and the track of their boss. Yeah, it's uh, – Penske's definitely struggled. Uh, to, that's just to put it mildly. Their highest qualified starter for Team Penske is the defending IndyCar champ, Joseph Newgarden. He starts 13th. Uh, it's just been – it's been a bad – Bad uh, couple weeks or so for Team Penske. Uh, tough break for the Chevy-powered uh, giant in IndyCar. So, uh, with those out of the way, that concludes the Gas and Go segment. And now we've got to talk about some other stuff. Hal Eastemp, please give us the good word about the almighty, ever-powerful Money Team Racing. Please give us something. The Money Team Racing news, once again, is that there is no news. No, Carl Edwards has not uh, accepted their contract offer, which doesn't exist. Bummer. Nobody is going there. I will now take this time to pivot to the new, I'm going to complain about Ferrari for a minute or more. Uh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Let's see. Charles Leclerc's engine just randomly turned off an attorney, took his seatbelt off, and drove around for two laps. You can't do that, Charles. You can't do that. That is not allowed. Um, also, when he got there, they didn't have the uh, seat belt replacement that he wanted, so they had to retire. It was They're going to retire anyway because there's no chance they make up any time. And the grand scheme of things, this is the worst of them. You put Sebastian Vell out there for 30 laps on mediums and then <laughs> leave him out there for 36 on softs? Are you kidding me? It's, they asked him... <laughs> To push, and then he go. They ask him, uh, "Do you think you can get it to be a one stopper?" What do you mean? You just ask him to push. He doesn't have anything left on these tires. It's unbelievable. This is this is a professional team. <laughs> it is astounding. I, it, this is from what I've gathered. Is this the norm? This is what the norm has been for Ferrari. <laughs> No. Just constant, no, the incompetence, because this is just ridiculous. No, this is, oh, my God. 30 laps on mediums, 36 on softs. <laughs> Don't they realize softs last less than the mediums? <laughs> this poor man, Sebastian Vettel, he, he kept a top 10 for them. He got seventh. He did everything he could. Aston Martin, Racing Point, if he goes there, please, please give this guy some sort of competent strategy because this has gotten to a new low. I mean, this is becoming a sitcom. I mean, a divorce sitcom at this point and between in, in the Ferrari organization. This has just been a disaster. My goodness. Yes, if you were or to teach an F1 fan, and that Ferrari was one of the greatest programs of all time and, and see them today, hey, they will think you are lying. Hey, they are not a top three team anymore. They're, they're getting to that point. Hey, you call me crazy for that, hey, but their strategy and their incompetence has put world note 
and poor Cindy ahead of them almost every single week. And I got to say that one positive that came out of that race for Sebastian Vettel, he got driver of the day from the fans. And it, it sounded like it meant a lot to him because I can't imagine how dejected you must be at this point in the season. You have not been having the season that anyone predicted. It is an immeasurable disappointment. That type of uh, recognition, I'm sure, goes a long way. Goodness. I was just going to say, um, what, with Vettel, well, he's having, uh, I mean, we talked about how Jimmy Johnson is having quite the farewell season from NASCAR in general. Sebastian Vettel is having one heck of a farewell <laughs> season from Ferrari. It's like, I don't know, it's, it's like an, a, it's, I, I don't know, it's, it's bad. It's like a bad sitcom between a couple who is on the verge of getting divorced and they can't stand each other. It's not good. Not good for Vettel, but uh, he's a trooper, we know, and uh, we'll just have to, there's, the next race is going to be in a couple weeks at Spa Francorchamps in Belgium. <sighs> It'll be something, a sight to behold. That's the money team minute with Hal Easteth. Although we might as well just say anything minute with Ferrari. <laughs> the, uh, speaking on Formula One, speaking on the subject of F1, a new agreement was reached, the Concord Agreement. It, uh, the specifics outlined include that all current 10 F1 teams have committed that they will be staying in the sport until 2025. Uh, there are also uh, there are no new teams that will be permitted in Formula One through the 2025 season. So, um, basically, the ten teams we have now are the ten teams we're going to have for a while, and this kind of makes sense in terms of financial stability, everything that's been thrown at F1 and racing in general with the COVID-19 pandemic that's been happening. Um, it, it makes sense from a financial standpoint in my mind. Uh, going through, uh, also, this was just announced today, the Williams F1 team, which had gone up for sale earlier this season, has now been acquired by Doralton Capital. Uh, so Williams will be able to keep going. Uh, their current drivers, obviously, are uh, George Russell and Nicholas Latifi. Former successful team, uh, pretty slow right now. Uh, I just... I had to bring that up now because of the comparison with or Justin with like this was once a top team Williams was also once a top team at one point it's it's a long slow painful decline hopefully they'll bring themselves back up though I will say though like it is definitely good to see that all 10 teams will be back because there were reports especially when the COVID-19 pandemic came out that four teams might have gone away and we've speculated a lot, and Ed saying that maybe Haas is not going to return, or maybe Williams is not going to return. Maybe, he, <clears throat> I mean, just a lot of teams on that chopping block. But it's good to see all ten teams are going to be a back at for or a couple more years. There will be a twenty car field, and it's definitely great to see that Williams will survive in some form and capacity. Um, there may be a name change. I don't know. I hope they don't, don't change the name, but it will definitely be good to see that all 10 teams are going to be on the grid at least through 2025, and I think that's the best outcome you could have hoped for if you were an F1 fan heading into the uh, pandemic. Yeah, and it brings in, like, uh, new questions that you could have because now we don't have to speculate, is Haas going to be or is Who's going to drive for Haas next year? It's stuff like that that will come out of it, thankfully. We don't have to worry about their immediate future. For sure. It's good to see um, <clears throat> the teams that really needed the financial stability, they'll still be around. And then, uh, also Williams will still be around in some way, shape, or form, uh, continuing on for the next several years. Other news that happened in the SRX, the Superstar Racing Experience that's formed by Tony Stewart and Ray Everham. The fifth driver was announced for their series beginning next season. Uh, longtime IndyCar and sports car racer Elio Castroneves is going to be running in the SRX next year. So uh, that makes five drivers to the stable for SRX in 2021. Um, he joins 
Tony Stewart, Tony Kanan, Paul Tracy, and Bobby Labonte. Uh, I would assume that more drivers will be announced in the coming days and weeks. Uh, Gen 7 testing has been resumed. It is back at Dover on Monday and Tuesday. NASCAR teams will be testing the Gen 7 car uh, this upcoming Monday and Tuesday at the Dover International Speedway after the NASCAR weekend there. Uh, Justin, you'll probably have uh, something about this. The Chicagoland Speedway, your home track, Chicagoland Speedway development plan was denied. The Joliet Plan Commission said no to NASCAR warehouses. Uh, the usually development-friendly commission turned down plans for warehouses outside the Chicagoland Speedway and a gas station on Route 6. Mayor Bob Odekirk and council members have also said they favor a moratorium on warehouse development along Route 53 after approving the controversial North Point project in April. Um, so basically, it was a unanimous decision to not have warehouses built on the Chicagoland Speedway property. Uh, however, uh, those who are in favor of the plan going through, uh, they've said they will try again at some point. Uh, that article, by the way, that I read off of is courtesy of the Herald News, uh, an article by Bob Ocon. Further yeah, down. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, a, to be honest, I probably wouldn't want to have, have warehouse spaces right next to that um, pristine property, I would I'd say. Um, I would definitely think that land is probably worth more. Or, and again, this is definitely a biased perspective here. Or, but I think that land could be used for something else i would I definitely want to see more of what atlanta's doing what kansas is doing i would want i kind of want to see more of that instead of of the um warehouse development so i wasn't i mean i wouldn't mind seeing more infrastructure and a lot more or going around that, that track again because that track is in the middle of nowhere or i'll be honest but but uh, i i'm not a big uh i wouldn't i'm not opposed to the fact that it's not the extra parking spaces because the track would definitely remain under this plan, but but um, I'm I was definitely not a big fan of the warehouse aspect of it, so oh, I'm not losing sleep over it. Chicago Land Speedway is going to be back on the schedule in 2021. The track is safe. If hey, there's no need to panic, it's not going the way of the old Chicago oh, oh the other Chicago Speedway hey, to come around in the 2000s. Uh, let's move on to the next topic at hand. IndyCar has re-signed a contract with the Portland International Raceway in Oregon. They will continue racing there through 2023. Uh, of course, uh, Portland is not on the calendar this season because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, however, IndyCar, in its last couple of years that it returned to Portland, uh, the races have been very, very successful. So there's obvious reason to return. Now we get into a section that is uh, pretty interesting, and I know uh, Justin's been working really hard on this, but uh, let's just say this much. When there's, where there's smoke, there's Larson. Now, Kyle Larson has been out of NASCAR since April after his infamous uh, racial epithet eye racing stream incident, where uh, in the aftermath, Larson was fired from his ride at Chip Ganassi Racing, and he was pretty much uh, blackballed by the sport, blacklisted, where uh, Larson has uh, been relegated now to competing on the dirt track circuit in the world of outlaws and just local dirt tracks in the area. And Larson's been killing it there. He has been dominating. It is evident just how good Larson is on the dirt track scene. At the same time, though, uh, due to from based on various reports and various sources, Larson has been doing a lot of work to improve himself as a person and to show that he is learning and, and has, is more socially aware of, of, of his environment, of everything that's going on around him. Uh, we saw earlier uh, around the time when uh, the many protests in the country were really ramping up, Kyle Larson uh, was at a memorial for George Floyd in Minneapolis. He's done volunteer work for organizations uh, of the like. And it really shows, it seems that Larson has um, 
is, or at least from what we can tell, he is learning from what happened back in April, and he's actively trying to improve himself on it. Now, there's a lot to digest with what has been going on here. Kyle Larson gave his first exclusive interview with the Associated Press. Uh, one of the things that Larson remarked about his incident back in April where he uttered a racial epithet derogatory to African-American uh, people, um, Larson's, uh, Larson talking about the incident and reflecting back on it, he called it, quote, uh, plain ignorance on his part. And to his credit, he's absolutely right. Uh, other things to keep in mind, um, Larson, uh, well, I should mention this, Tony Stewart is, gets involved in this. Stewart went on a media tour expressing a strong interest in the return of Kyle Larson to NASCAR. Tony stated that Larson had not yet been reinstated by NASCAR. This has been, um, uh, this has been confirmed by various sources. Larson has now formally filed for reinstatement. He has requested to be reinstated by NASCAR. A ruling has not come down yet by NASCAR. Uh, they haven't reinstated him yet. Um, there's a lot of debate that can be done about whether or not Kyle Larson deserves to be reinstated. But uh, that was hours. Uh, Larson asked to be reinstated into NASCAR hours after Tony Stewart had uh, broached the subject about Kyle Larson coming back to NASCAR. There's a lot to be said, um, although I think we can all agree just in the back of our minds on, uh, on, a, on, I'm trying to find the right words here. We can all agree that what Larson did back in April was bad, really, really bad. And some are not going to easily forgive him for it. Some may never forgive him for it. Part of my phone going off there. Some may not forgive him for it, and that's all right. It's understandable why they wouldn't. But if Larson truly shows that he has genuinely learned something from this experience, if he has shown that he has improved himself, that he's bettered himself from this, from this um, act that he committed, from the words he said back in April, if he really shows that, then eventually people will come around to forgive him. At least that's the hope. Um, the, uh, we, we can, I'm, I don't wanna to dwell too much on the subject, but I'm sure that that helps get the point across as to what we're trying to say. So uh, Justin, I know you've been working hard on that board behind you there, uh, considering Stuart Haas racing and Ford performance, everything that could go on in the silly season because it was also announced, uh, it was, uh, reported yesterday by Jim Utter of motorsport.com that Corey LaJoy would not be coming back to go fast racing next season. And LaJoy himself confirmed that today. So that 32 car is wide open now. And you got to start thinking, hey, if Larson gets reinstated, there's really one big place he can go. Considering how Tony Stewart, a NASCAR team owner, has been lobbying heavily for Kyle Larson to come back to NASCAR. Uh, Justin, I'll let you take it from here because uh, you've got some <laughs> big stuff behind you. I'll, let me change it over here. Yeah, let's say, let's just say the dominoes have been falling. I cannot not see this being just a coincidence. This has definitely been a marketing tactic by Tony Stewart. They've picked their time almost, almost perfect. I mean, perfectly, and I'm just gonna say, I'm just going to say this. I'm not sure that Larson and should come back just yet, Ed, but it definitely looks like Tony Stewart is very, very interested in having Kyle Larson back in the Cup Series. And I think there's only one – I mean, and if Kyle Larson is to come back, it's going to go through Stewart Haas Racing. Now, now, what in the world does that all do? So I'm going to uh, try to lean this back a little bit. And try to get the angle on and it here. So right now we have at the 2020 roster and we have at the 2021 on this side. Okay. Right now, oh, you have Harvick, Almeral, Boyer, Custer, and LaJoy, a 42020, a right now in the SHR camp. Go fast, 
signed a deal last year with Storehouse Racing. They are now an affiliate of SHR. So, oh, you also have Chase Briscoe, and we know Chase Briscoe has been very excellent in this season. And Chase Briscoe has had, had five wins on the year. He's going to be a factor in the Final Four, for most likely. And he said he needs about eight wins to get up to the Cup Series. So, with Lark, with Joy now out, you know, and we also have to keep in mind, Kevin Harvick has a contract. He resigned through 2024. His deal was supposed to expire last year. I mean, or not last year, but next year, he signed a three-year extension onto that deal. He's not going anywhere. Cole Custer, he's got ties with Haas Racing, and he's got at the uh, money in the backing. He's not going anywhere or either. So what that leaves is two cars at SHR open, Eric Amarola and Clint Boyer. Er, those two rides are, are available. However, it looks like, and, and mostly all signs are pointed to Smithfield staying, and that just seems like a, on the eye test, Smithfield is sailing. So most likely, you're going to have Amarola in the tank car next season. Now, oh, What's not going to happen is LaJoy being in the 32. That opens up, up, up the affiliate organization. So what it seems to me like what is happening right now is Sword Hots is going to go take a play out of the JGR textbook. They are going to go with at the, um, I would say, the affiliate team in first for Chase Briscoe, because keep in mind, Chase Briscoe, he's only in year two. Cole Custer had three years in, in the experience series. This is Chase Briscoe's second season. And I, the theory in, in going on right now is Chase Briscoe will move up, up to the Cup Series next season in the 32 car. So what happens to the 14? It seems like all signs have pointed to this happening. Clint Boyer is going to be out. And it looks like Kyle Larson and we'll be taking that 14 car. That is Tony Stewart's car. You have to keep in mind. And it wouldn't be the 10. That 10 car is Gene Haas's is a vehicle. Oh, so right now, it looks like the lineup for 2021, and based on all the uh, stuff going on this past week, it looks like it's going to be Harvick, Almero, Larson, Briscoe, oh, Custer, er, with Briscoe in the 32. Where does that leave Colin Boyer? Where does that leave Corey LaJoy? Most likely, Corey LaJoy or Clint Boyer, that will most likely go to the 37 car. There, there's a couple of cars available. Oh, you have the 21, uh, which will most likely be a battle between pre, I mean, Cindric, Austin Cindric or Matt Benedetto. Oh, that's most likely going to be the case there. Michael McDowell has been rumored to go with Justin Mark, so he might, might be a, um, available. Oh, for the 34 car. Ryan Priest has definitely been, had his name thrown out there. The 37 does not look secure for next season. The 42 is open, but we've heard a ton of rumors as to who will take that. Bubba Wallace has been in, in talks. Uh, so you obviously have Ross Chastain. They could go with another veteran, or they could go with if a journeyman like Clint Boyer. You also have at the 43, which is basically a Bubba Wallace as whether or not he decides to stay. And then, if so, if he doesn't, who, who replaces the car there? Yeah, obviously, the 48 is still available, and Daniel Suarez is also a one-year deal. So a lot of free agency stuff. But right now, it looks like Stuart Haas is going to go with the JGR tactic of putting their young gun inside an affiliate team for the time being and, and letting the dominoes fall from there or it looks like Larson may be back in the Cup Series in 2021 in that 14 car. All right. So that's a breakdown of everything going on. Uh, I'll turn it over to Hal just for a follow-up on this. Um, what are the chances Larson comes back, and how likely is it that he comes back with Stuart Haas? Uh, how likely is he comes back? It's all going to depend on NASCAR if they feel it's time to reinstate him. That is what it is mostly dependent on. I have no doubts in my mind he's coming back with Stuart Haas. Whenever he comes back, it's going to be with them. I feel like that is just how it's going to go. If not now, then I would imagine if, if they can't do it for next year, 
what do they do? Would they re-sign Boyer for one more year and then the year yeah. after? Uh, that's that's my guess. If that if if Larson's reinstatement is denied, then they would probably re-sign Boyer just for a one-year contract and keep going on one-year contracts until well they run out and Boyer. I, I, out. I would say they'd give him. They they wouldn't deny Larson that long if he keeps continuing to show that he is changing for the better. And I'll give him credit. It seems like he is. So I would say that the reinstatement would come sooner rather than later if he keeps it up. Um, yeah, I, I agree with just about yeah everything on the Stuart Haas lineup with Go Fast. And my question will be, with Briscoe in the affiliate car, are they going to put more resources into Go Fast to help them out akin to Furniture Row? They might. I, I, I they will. I mean, that's got to be a big question. I mean, obviously, Briscoe would bring – and sponsorship, I would think, and to that 32 car. Obviously, right now, oh, the 32 car or isn't really the best as in terms of sponsorship deals. Obviously, they they have a nine race, three hundred fifty thousand dollar or deal. That's not exactly you know, luxurious compared to what Smithfield is paying with a thirty five million dollar deal with Eric Almirola or for most of the season. And you could definitely say. A, that go fast isn't right now having the best a situation with their sponsorship in terms of their value. So, so they're kind of getting low ball on in terms of that. Sponsor will remain nameless. It's, however, er, it's going to be very interesting to see because I don't even question, okay, a, a, if that is the lineup, uh, Harvick X locked until 2024. Eric Almirola would get re signed. And how long? That who knows. Clint, I mean, obviously Kyle Larson would be back, and it would most likely be more than three year a three year deal. Oh, wouldn't you think? And yeah. Stuart Haas yeah. would. I mean, Tony Stewart would want Larson in for the long run. And then you have Cole Cusser, who uh, is kind of a, a money driver. He is kind of a money driver when it comes to the sponsorship backing. So he has that ride and. Thanks to his affiliates with the Haas organization and, and the Haas as a sponsor, he's got that ride locked up for as long as he wants. It's kind of a Paul Menard situation mm-hmm. and when it comes to that. So my question is, if that is the deal, if that is the deal going on, what happens to uh, Briscoe? Briscoe would be in the 32 car or for more than two years likely. He, Hey, Briscoe would definitely get the short end of the stick here, as well as Clint Boyer. Or obviously, hey, I would be very curious to see if Chase Briscoe oh, and everything that I've said happens, what happens to Chase Briscoe? Because I don't think he's going to want to stay in that 32 for more than two years. I think you're, when you compare it to JGR, you're basically – that's the identical thing that would happen – the young driver will have to go somewhere else to go succeed. If he isn't able to succeed in the 32 itself, if he can, that's, that's going to be impressive. Yeah. But I would say it would be a kind of Eric Jones, early Joey Logano, where someone's going to poach him away. It'll happen. Good drivers don't just stick in a mediocre ride. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is, it is the situation that like JGR and furniture row. I, I feel like, if this is going to be a, come a more common occurrence, I feel like Furniture Row, uh, before they went under, is probably going to be the outlier in this situation. Now, given uh, JGR aligned themselves with Levine Family Racing, but LFR is going under, although that's because of the wide variety of, uh, there's a lot of varying circumstances, and most of them brought on by the pandemic, um, which is unfortunate. But with this situation, it is kind of looking with between Stuart Haas and Go Fast. It is looking like a JGR and Furniture Row situation. Um, hopefully, um, Go Fast doesn't go under. But if they do get more resources, if they get more funding, and if Chase Briscoe does happen to go to the 32 and somehow does amazing there, just on the off chance that he is amazing and wins like three races for them, for example. Because it could happen, you never know. Uh, Go Fast might even look at if they get enough funding, starting a second team, 
because that's what Furniture Row did in 2017 when they when Truex won right out the box after their alignment with JGR. They started a second team so that Eric Jones could go there. Now Jones left after a year to take Matt Kenseth's spot, but um, it's something that it's possible. It's something to definitely keep in mind, but it'll definitely be interesting because all of this hinges on whether or not Kyle Larson gets reinstated. And I think once the word comes down from NASCAR, whether or not he gets back in, the floodgates are going to open for who goes where. And it'll, it, that is really going to be the determining factor. That's, that's the big point that we're waiting on right now. I think there are so there are so many I, there are so many uh, dominoes right now, all that are going to determine which one is going to fall first. There's, I think no matter what the big I mean obviously you have the Xfinity domino who wins out of Chase Briscoe versus Noel Gregson versus Austin Cindric that's got to be a question everybody is going to have. What happens with Bubba Wallace? Where does Bubba Wallace go? That's a big domino that is yet to fall. Kyle Larson, is he going to say, hey, that's going to be a huge question. I mean, is Kyle Larson going to remain banned from NASCAR or is he going to be coming back? And if so, how is he coming back? Because there's also, um, even in talks of the Xfinity series, is for him to lay low. Oh, again, but again, and if this is the strategy, is going, Stuart Haas Racing is going to have, have go from one of the, uh, the more questionable lineups to a rock solid lineup for at least two or three years. There's not going to be many changes coming out of that SHR group up on a year to year basis, except for maybe the Xfinity series. And that definitely, and that also brings up another question. What happens to the Ford pipe pipeline? And if, if all the cup series, I mean, all the cup cars are filled, oh, what happens ends with them I mean, with Ford, because the only other two options are Roush Fenway, which Roush Fenway doesn't have a, co- I mean, an Xfinity affiliate. Do they? Do they just shove all the guys? He's from the Xfinity, a Ford side to for Roush Fenway, or, or I mean, does as Penske open up a fourth car? Does, what happens to Wood Brothers? There is just a ton, and I mean, a ton of questions we do not have the answers to, and I think it's going to be a lot. And I mean a lot, depending on Kyle Larson. Who would have thought uh, after or April, Kyle Larson would be a, the domino uh, that would have massive, massive implications of what happens in, in between now uh, and 2021 when we, we start the season off again at Daytona? Definitely, uh, definitely something. Uh... It, I mean, back in April, we thought Kyle Larson, yeah, he's done. Well, he's done the work. It really shows that it seems that he's genuinely learning. And um, given that he gets reinstated, could be a big comeback story for him. And also a big player in the silly season. It's the silly season for a reason, because we just don't know how it's uh, how it's going to go. Um. Let's see. Let's go ahead. We've, we've got through the other news. Let's go ahead and talk about the big show that is this weekend. The Indianapolis 500. Yes. The 104th running of the greatest spectacle in racing. Uh, the 2020 Indianapolis 500. Now, uh, there, was, there has been a lot of discussion surrounding this event, considering how there are not going to be any fans permitted inside the track no fans at the indy 500 this year um which is unfortunate um just based on some insider information it sounds like indianapolis the the speedway itself they wanted to try and have fans there at a limited capacity uh however um due to some pressure from some corporate partners and other factors uh, they eventually made the decision no fans there just for the sake of public health. Um, it's, it's understandable why, uh, but con- also considering how these NASCAR races have been held uh, with fans there at a limited capacity, and amazingly, and I think this is also to commend NASCAR in some fashion, with all the races that have been held, 
uh, and even though COVID-19 numbers are rising in several places across the country, there hasn't yet been a link to COVID-19 outbreaks based on NASCAR races being held in certain towns. Outbreaks uh, occurring, they have not been traced back to the races, which I think we can all say is honestly a great thing. It's good that uh, no one has gotten sick, uh, has been has contracted the virus from going to these races. Now there have been some questionable uh, things there, uh, and there's debate as to whether or not social distancing has been properly enforced in certain areas. But at the very least, it does not look as if anyone has contracted the virus from going to these races. So NASCAR and, in a sense, the uh, track security should be commended for that. Um, IMS, I feel, wanted to do something similar to that, but uh, eventually they kind of their hand was kind of forced, to put it bluntly. So no fans at the 500. It's unfortunate, but at the very least, if those fans uh, watch the race on TV or if they'll probably be seated somewhere on the property, maybe just outside the track, listening to the engines, socially distanced, obviously. But the TV ratings, I would imagine, are going to be pretty big. Because uh, usually the local TV uh, in Indianapolis is blacked out for the race. That will not be the case this year. The race will be aired in the Indianapolis area. And the 500 tends to be a big thing for the economy of Indianapolis. And at the same time, uh, there was also con uh, consideration that the 500 wouldn't be held because no fans would be allowed, uh, which would make the first time since 1945 that the 500 wouldn't be held. Uh, in 1945, the U.S. was in World War II at the time, which is why they didn't hold the race then. Uh, however, the, the race kind of had to be held this year because uh, from what we understand, a lot of teams were in financial turmoil and had the race not happened, several IndyCar teams would be facing some severe financial troubles where they could be going out of business at the end of the season. The race had to happen for, uh, for the teams to keep going and for sponsorship purposes. So the race will go on. No fans in attendance, but they'll still try to put on a good show. Now, the last couple of weeks, even though the pandemic has forced it from May to August, uh, the last couple of weeks have been pretty interesting. Practices have been going on and qualifying has been happening. Uh, the official entry list of a few notable things. Fernando Alonso is back this year driving again for uh, McLaren, except this time it's with their partnership of Aero McLaren SP. And he will be teaming up with the two regular drivers, Pato O'Ward and Oliver Askew. Elio Castroneves is back once again. Uh, uh, Jonathan Bird Racing announced that they would not be fielding a dedicated entry this season due to financial issues. Uh, but they later uh, came up with a deal quickly with uh, Dale Coyne Racing, along with, uh, <laughs> along with the almighty NASCAR's Rick Ware, uh, to field a car for James Davison in this race. Rick Ware's getting his foot in everything. Uh, Dragon Speed is also back with their driver, Ben Hanley. Now, only 33 cars are in this race, so no one failed to qualify, and nobody was bumped out of the field. Um, normally, that would be a little concerning. However, because of the ongoing circumstances, I think we can all just say that we're happy that there's 33 cars there considering it was a little uh, questionable as the race drew closer. However, uh, qualifying was this past weekend. Uh, they had full field qualifying on Saturday and then qualifying again for the Fast 9 the following day on Sunday. And, gentlemen, I think it's only proper if we go through the starting grid from last to first. My favorite race of the year, my favorite race ever. Let's go ahead and do it. So let me get the starting grid right now in fact i'll go ahead and share the screen because why not let's go ahead and do just that here we go here it is the starting lineup for the 104th running of the indianapolis 500 mile race 
On the outside of row number 11, making his second consecutive start in the greatest spectacle in racing, driving for dragon speed, here's the United Kingdom's Ben Hanley. In the middle of row 11, the man who came oh so close to winning this race in 2011, uh, 2011 race rookie of the year, J.R. Hildebrand. Remember, Hildebrand crashed on the last corner from the lead. That gave Dan, the late Dan Weldon his final Indy 500 win. On the inside of row 11, uh, making another start for Dreyer and Reinbold Racing, Nazareth, Pennsylvania's Sage Cara. Moving on to row number 10, on the outside, driving for the Trevor Carlin operation. Uh, please welcome former Formula One driver Max Chilton. In the middle of row 10, making his 10th 500 start in his first for the legendary A.J. Foyt, here is California's Charlie Kimball. On the inside of row number 10, a three-time winner of this event in 2001, 2002, and 2009. Driving for the iconic magnet Team Penske, here is Brazil's Elio Castroneves. On to row number nine on the outside, making his, trying to remember when, the, I think it's his seventh Indy 500 start. Here is Australia's James Davison. In the middle of row number nine, making his second 500 start and his first since 2017, two-time Formula One world champion from Spain, Fernando Alonso. On the inside, the defending champion of the Indianapolis 500 from France, it's Simon Pagano. To the outside of row number eight, the first of five rookies in the field driving for A.J. Foyt. Here's Canada's Dalton Kellett. In the middle of row eight, the 2013 winner of this event from Brazil, driving for A.J. Foyt, Tony Kanaan. On the inside of row eight, the 2018 champion of this event from Toowoomba, Australia, it's Will Power. On to lucky row number seven. On the outside, driving car number seven for Arrow McLaren SP, the 2019 Indy Light Series champion from Florida, Oliver Askew. In the middle, driving for the Meyer Shank operation from the United Kingdom, here's Jack Harvey. On the inside of row seven, last year's Indy 500 Rookie of the Year, driving for Dale Coyne Racing, Santino Perucci. Getting to the middle of the field now on the outside of row number six, Noblesville, Indiana's own Connor Daly, driving for Ed Carpenter Racing. In the middle, starting 17th, making his third Indy 500 start for Andretti Autosport, here's Zach Veach. On the inside, an Indianapolis native, three-time pole winner, of the 500, here is Ed Carpenter. To the outside of row number five we go, making his Indy 500 debut from Mexico. It's the 2018 Indy Lights champion, Pato Award. In the middle, making his second 500 start for Team Ganassi, Sweden's Felix Rosenquist. And on the inside, the defending champion of the NTT IndyCar Series, here's Tennessee's Joseph Newgarden. Newgarden is the highest qualified starter for Team Penske. On the outside of row number four, driving a special conjunction car between Team, between Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan Racing, and a Citroni Buell Autosport. Here is California's Spencer Piggott. Piggott, the 2016 or 15 Indy Lights champion. In the middle of row four, making his second consecutive 500 start and his first for Chip Ganassi, the second Swedish driver in the field, Marcus Ericsson. On the inside of row four, one of the fastest drivers out of the Andretti stable from California, it's Colton Herta. And now we come to the Fast Nine on the outside of row number three, the 2016 winner of this event as a rookie, 
Nevada City, California's Alexander Rossi. In the middle of row three, he's the son of the 1986 winner of this event, Bobby Ray Hall. Here from Ohio, it's Graham Ray Hall. On the inside, another rookie from Spain driving for Dale Coyne Racing and Team Go. Here is Alex Polo. On to the outside of row number two, the 2016 pole sitter for this event from Canada. It's the mayor of Hinchtown, James Hinchcliffe. In the middle, the 2014 winner of this event and 2012 IndyCar Series champion, Ryan Hunter Ray. On the inside of row two, the highest qualified rookie in the field driving for Ed Carpenter. Here is Dutchman Renus VK. And now to the front row on the outside, the 2017 winner of this event from Tokyo, Japan, Takuma Sato. In the middle of the front row, he is a 2008 winner of this event and multiple pole sitter for this race. Here is the New Zealander, Scott Dixon. On the inside, starting on the pole, making his 15th Indy 500 start, Nazareth, Pennsylvania, it's Marco Andretti. So there are the 33 starters for the 104th running of the Indianapolis 500 mile race. Tried doing uh, my best uh, <clears throat> Dave Calabro impression and hopefully a track hires me someday in the future. So. <laughs> There you have it, the 33 starters, the fast 33 that will be taking the green flag this Sunday for what will be a very unique, very strange, but uh, uh, arguably very special Indianapolis 500. Uh, we went through who was the fastest. We had made our picks for the poll last week um, between Marco Andretti, Fernando Alonso, and Takuma Sato. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the race pans out because a lot can happen and anything really can happen at Indianapolis. Um, what are you saying, fellas? We've got some races to go over as well. That was just going over uh, Indy 500. Carb day was today. Uh, no, There were no outstanding incidents, so the 33 drivers that were listed are the 33 starting. Uh, what do you say we go ahead and make some picks? Let's do it. Let's go. All right. So let's go ahead. There are two Cup Series races this weekend. I'll go ahead and uh, pull that, pull up the entry list first for those. There will be, it's the Dryden 311 Race 1. That's going to be the first race held tomorrow, August the 22nd. I'll go ahead and share the uh, screen with you all. Here we go. So, last week's winner, Chase Elliott, is going to be starting on the pole for this race. Denny Hamlin alongside, followed by Martin Truex, Clint Boyer, Joey Logano, Jimmy Johnson, Brad Keselowski, William Byron, Kurt Busch, and Kevin Harvick. That is the top ten. Now, uh, other notable starters, Chris Buescher will start in 12th, uh, Michael McDowell in 15th. Going further down the list, Kyle Busch is starting 22nd. Bubba Wallace in 24th, Corey LaJoy in 29th, and going further, Austin Dillon is back this week. He'll start 32nd. Uh, yeah, 40 cars to choose from. Let's go ahead and start with Justin Palmer for this. Justin, your pick for the first cup race this weekend. I think it's been far too long since this guy's gotten a win, and, and I think it is going to be finally time and for this driver or to get it yet another win this season. You thought I was going to go with Jimmy Johnson? Not today. It is Denny Hamlin and the winner of race one. I just cannot see Denny Hamlin and letting in the past couple of races slide. I think Denny Hamlin is due to get back in victory lane, and I think he gets it done at Dover. All right, Hal, your pick. All right, I'm going to do every NASCAR fan a favor today, and I'm not going to pick Jimmy Johnson for either thank race. You. You're welcome. You're welcome. When he wins, you will thank me. Um, let me see here. 
You know, speaking of guys who have been just on a schneid since Cole Perns left, I think I think Martin Truex Jr. needs a win specifically because if you just think long term, he can't keep going like this because the future would be bleak if he continues underperforming what everyone's expectations are. So Martin Truex Jr. starts to get that ball rolling again. Yeah, Truex is a <clears throat> excuse me. Truex is a pretty good pick. I think um, I'm going to try not to copy off anyone, um, but if you didn't pick Truex, I was going to. Um, instead, I'm going to pick the pole sitter. I think Chase Elliott, he's really, really good at Dover. I think that's something that uh, not a lot of people have focused on in the past. But if you remember back to 2018, this was one of the races that he won, or at least one of the tracks he won, Dover. Um, has been a fairly successful track for Chase in the past. In fact, he almost got his first win here in 2017, but then Kyle Busch passed him late in the going. So uh, there's that to keep in mind. So again, our picks, Chase Elliott, Denny Hamlin, and uh, uh, shoot, Chase Elliott, Denny Hamlin, Martin Truex, now that I remember it. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the uh, second cup race, the entry list, I'll just pull it up here. It uh, doesn't look to be any different, really. There's 40 cars, and they all appear to be the same. Um, in fact, I, I could be wrong, but I think James Davison w- might – no, he's not. He's not. He's going to be at the 500. thought he might be running one of the doubleheader events, but that doesn't appear to be the case. 40 cars. Justin, who gets the second race? I said a Hendrick car would win this weekend, and I am sticking by that, and I got to go with Chase Elliott. I, I just can't see him winning from the pole, but I can definitely see him winning and knock down a few pegs on the starting grid, and I think Chase Elliott is going to be a factor. Here. It's going to be a surprising week not seeing Kevin Harvick at competing and up front towards the win, especially considering the fact that he's won three of the double headers so far out of the four. But I think Chase Elliott is too good at Dover. He'll get his third win of the regular season, and that will be a ton of momentum heading into the postseason a week, a week later. That was not where I thought you'd go with it. I thought you might go Jimmy this time. I guess we're all avoiding the curse. We all feel that same energy. At least that's what I'm going to say. Um, yeah, let me – Check out my handy dandy statistics. I don't think Daniel Suarez will win this race. I just have a weird feeling about that. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Brad Keselowski. I just think we have established what the norm for Brad Keselowski in a playoff year is. He needs to get another one, right? I mean, or else he's gonna get one in the first round. That'd be crazy. So I think he'll get it in the second race at Dover. All right. So uh, let's see. We have one for Brad Keselowski, one for Chase Elliott. Um, I'm going to pick Martin Truex for this one. I feel like if he doesn't win the first race, Dover, Truex historically has been really, really good. Uh, Truex has been really good at Dover in the past. So I'm going to pick him for at least one of these races because he's going to win one of these in my, in my mind. Okay, so we've made our cup picks. Let's go for the Xfinity Series. They, too – have two races going on. Here's the first race starting lineup. You got Austin Sindrick and Noah Gragson starting on the front row. Uh, they're definitely not going to wreck each other, or at least Gragson mm-hmm. probably won't wreck Sindrick. Who knows? Brandon Jones um, and Harrison Burton starting third and fourth. It's JGR second row. Rest of the top ten, Justin Allgaier, Riley Herbst, Jeremy Clements, Michael Annette, Ryan Sieg, and Chase Briscoe. Further down the grid, you look for any notables. There is Justin Haley in 22nd. Uh, Anthony Alfredo is in the RCR t- uh, 21 this week. He is 26th. Jeb Burton is in the eight car this week, 27th. Brett Moffitt is back behind the wheel of the Hour Motorsports 02 uh, in 28th. Jeffrey Arnhardt in the zero car. He's 30th. And it's a pretty short field, 36 cars uh, for – 200 laps around Dover in the Xfinity series. Starting with Justin, 36 drivers to choose from. Who you got? Well, I think it's not going to be Austin Centric. I think this is a track that he is going to have a handful of. 
And so I got to go with if Chase Briscoe. I cannot I'd say off the forward beaten path. Cole Custer won this race last year. They have that. They'll probably use the same car, I would imagine. And from Dover last season, unless they've retired it, I see no way Haas is going to be beaten in, in this weekend twice. Give me a, a Chase Briscoe game. Win number six out of eight. He needs to get up to the Cup Series. I like chaos. I like people who cause chaos. Dover sometimes has a little bit of chaos. I think Noah Gragson is going to win, and he's going to move somebody to do it, and no one's going to be happy at the end. Question, will it be his teammate? There is a high chance it could be his teammate. I don't think he cares. Okay, uh, maybe a follow-up question. Why will it be Justin Allgaier? Because Justin Allgaier is cursed this year and not allowed to win. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually here's the thing I'm actually going to pick Justin Allgaier for this race he oh, is no. due for a victory <laughs> he is due for one he is due for a victory and Dover is a track that he has won at in the past uh, he held off I think it was Elliot Sadler in a fantastic duel to the end one season uh, 2018 I'm gonna think- yeah, 2018. I'm going to take Allgaier to take this, and I say if Noah Gragson's in front of him, Allgaier is finally going to have enough of being the nice guy and just do a bump and run on Gragson. He's got to do it. Return the favor for Bristol. Yep. Uh, let's see. Going on to the second race, race number two that the Xfinity Series will run on Sunday before the Cup event. Uh, Daniel Hemrick's going to be driving the eight car. So Jeb Burton will be in, in the eight for the first race, and then Daniel Hamrick will take it for the second. Uh, doesn't look to be too much different. Yeah, because Anthony Alfredo is back in the 21. So here you go, 36 cars to choose from. Justin, who you got? Yeah, I can't avoid Noah Gregson and for forever. I got to take him during the second race. I think the first race, they're going to struggle a bit, but I think – and the Hendricks are too good not to win at this ace track. Mm. Or JR Motorsports. Take your pick. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Yeah, I'm going to go Chase Briscoe. He has just not had it for a little bit. Um, I'm not saying it's because Zipidelli's not behind the crew chief box or anything, but I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Well, all right. Chase Briscoe for one. Noah Gragson for one. Um, let's see. Well, I was already. I was actually thinking about picking Gragson uh, since I feel like he's just going to boot someone out of the way deep down in the back <laughs> of our minds. We just know it. But I'm going to mix things up. I'm going to try to pick somebody different. Um, I'm going to pick. Okay, I'm just going to go with an outsider pick and go with Harrison Burton. Burton ran really well in the truck race here uh, last season. And Burton, he just hasn't had the best of luck lately, but I feel like if everything comes together, he'll find himself there at the front. And he's got, I mean, he almost won at Kansas. I do want to point that out. He almost won at Kansas. The only reason he didn't is because Joe Graff Jr. happened. But, um, yeah, Harrison Burton, I feel like he's got the speed. He just hasn't had the luck. If everything lines up, if everything aligns, then Burton might find himself with a victory. Okay. So now that we went over the NASCAR side, let's I'm gonna pull up the Indy five hundred starting grid again. Because we are going to make our picks for who will win the Indianapolis five hundred for the year two thousand twenty. Thirty three drivers to choose from. Justin Palmer, who is your pick to put themselves on the Borg Warner Trophy and why? Oh, this is going to be so tough for me to pick. Is it, this isn't like F1 where or you could just say Hamilton and call it a day. This isn't like NASCAR where or you kind of know who's going to have it. It's definitely going to be a Honda that's winning this race, but who is it going to be? And I just can't just that – an orange paint scheme of James Hinchcliffe 
is just staring at me right in the face. I just cannot and avoid that feeling that this is his time. And Hinchcliffe gets the nap, add his face to that beautiful trophy. He, James Hinchcliffe is my pick for the winner of the Indianapolis 500 this weekend. A comeback story that would be from nearly losing his life at the Speedway in a practice crash in 2015 to pole sitter 2016 to getting just this one-off opportunity a victory would mean so much to the driver from Canada. Hal Easton, your pick to win and why? I have to go with Marco Andretti. The speed has yeah. been there, and I know I just stole it, and I also may have just cursed him. I don't curse any cars. You cursed him. I don't of curse any cars. You did. That, that's not how that works. I don't curse any cars. Ask Joseph Newgarden. He won with me. You. You do realize the Andretti curse doesn't need, need to add on more curses. It's like a, the, it's like Steve Bart Erdman and with the Chicago Cubs, Billy go curse. That's not that's not a curse. That's just uh, you should have gotten the out at shortstop. That's oh, what that was. Oh, I'm not oh, wrong. Oh, Gonzalez oh, is the real one that. to blame here. <laughs> I, I'm not denying that. And Steve Bartman was obviously a he scapegoated. Was, but, he was scapegoated. And, that poor man did not deserve that. <laughs> It, 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 like, like, but that's the comparison. And see, that's something that is completely out of the ra random and not in the terms of. Uh, I mean, yes, it did have an effect, like, but, but that should not have been the reason why. You're just in one. You are that's literally the. You are happen. literally going to be the Steve Bartman, and of and the reason why Marco Andretti is not going to win the Indianapolis 500 this year. Hold, hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. Let's let's get back on track here. So we have one for James Hinchcliffe, one for Marco Andretti. How if by some chance you continue this Andretti curse single-handedly? <laughs> now hold we're on. We're gonna have also, problems. Also, we're gonna have a, have to have a talk here. He's had 14 tries before this. This isn't new if he doesn't win this one. Well, the closest he came was okay. He almost won in 2006. He almost had it, and then Sam Hornish Jr. had enough of a run to get by him on the last 100 feet of the, of the race. And then Listen. 2012, arguably, it should have been his, but circumstances didn't work out in his favor. And then when he was trying to get back to the front, um, back up to the front, he crashed uh, with about 10 to go. All I'm going to so, tell you is that six-year-old me didn't root for Marco Andretti. I can tell you that much. <laughs> yeah, we might not have been watching IndyCar then. Uh, I, I swear. <laughs> I, I, I swear he's gonna be leading with. I swear he's gonna be leading with like twenty laps to go, and he's gonna blow a tire coming out four. Don't jinx right. it. That that is literally if how. That's exactly said. what happens. I'm blaming you. All right. All right. <laughs> okay, I'll take blame if that happens. All right. Here's the thing. Here. All right. I'm gonna make my pick. I'll make my pick for this. Uh, I know that things certain. I mean, 2020 has been a roller coaster. It's been full of ups and downs all over, mostly downs, but there have been some ups. And I guess I'll draw off a little bit of, of, of my experiences too. Because uh, for those who know me, and well, Hal knows us too, because he's one as well. Hal and I are massive Chiefs fans. And I can tell you that when we started this playoff run last season, or well, or back in January, in the back of my mind, I, I mean, on the outside, I thought, man, the Chiefs are doing really, really well. But in the back of my mind, I always worried, what's going to go wrong this time? Because something always goes wrong. Something always happened. Except this year, it didn't. They actually went to the Super Bowl. And then I thought, oh, well, at least we got this far. What's going to go wrong in the Super Bowl? And then they came back and won. It was incredible. And now, obviously, with the pandemic, it makes me, it makes me as a Chiefs fan think, well, at least we won the Super Bowl before COVID ruined everything. It seems like a special year of sorts. The last time an Andretti won the Indy 500 was 1967 when Mario Andretti won it. Michael Andretti ran the Indy 500 between 15 and 20 times 
1992, I think, was the best shot for Michael to win it. 13 laps to go. He's leading by a full lap at least. He had lapped the field. The fuel pressure goes away on the car, and his race ends in turn three on the apron. Uh, anyone would be gutted in that situation, obviously. But the way things have played out, with the way COVID postponed the race from May to August, there aren't any fans there. It's unique circumstances. There's got to be some kind of pick-me-up. And while how may or may not curse Marco Andretti, on the off chance that a pick from him does curse Andretti. I feel like this is the year Marco Andretti gets it done. Realistically, like I, I, it's probably superstitious of me to do it, but Marco's been working at this 15 years. His car has been one of, if not the fastest throughout the month. I think if anyone's got a real shot at challenging Marco Andretti, it's the guy starting in second, Scott Dixon. Because Dixon has got a fast car. There's no denying it. But the way things have been working out, I feel like sometimes you just got to have a little bit of lady luck. And with these circumstances that have been unfolding, 2020, it's, I mean, come on, it's being considered a write-off already. But maybe, just maybe, if something works out uh, with the collective race, racing fandom, Perhaps if Marco Andretti wins the Indy 500, it is enough to salvage 2020 as a decent year. So I'm going to pick Marco Andretti to win this Indy 500. And that's going to do it. That takes us to the end of this show. Uh, closing in on 930, but uh, that, that covers it. That's everything. So four NASCAR races this weekend, but the pinnacle of everything is this Sunday at noon, local time for us, with the Indianapolis 500. That's going to do it for our show. Any last words before we end this socially distanced show? I just want to say that with this going on, the Indy 500, I'd like to bring attention that there are talks to Ferrari once again to IndyCar, and quite frankly, get ready for that entertainment. I am just hoping, just do it. I want more to yell about. Uh, I I feel bad. I feel bad for going after or how, but I so desperately want and Marco and Jerry to get this win. It you would be one. It would be one of the most wonderful stories is right now in the in sports in general. Oh, just for Andretti to finally get that 500 victory that they have, they should have gotten long ago. Oh, I want to see it, and but and uh, and I just can't. How you know my distrust in your picks? Well, and, here's the thing: you could have gone the Lewis Hamilton route of everyone picked Marco Andretti. In a way, you were also responsible. I picked, <laughs> I picked first, though. Keep in mind, I picked first. I don't, like, I picked on first on this. It's, it's Sterling. I really hope uh, you will negate eight house powers this I'm weekend. Here. <laughs> In case uh, Hal has powers that we don't know about, I am negating the curse. And tr Trust I, me, if this goes forward and there is a curse, I'm going to start using it for evil. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> but, oh. This oh. is... It's, it's been an interesting show, although realistically I was going to pick Marco regardless because I feel like just with everything that's been going on, the unique circumstances, how fast his car has been. I mean, uh, we can talk about how Marco has been a competitor for the 500 year after year after year after year after year. The, I mean, there's so much going on and so much is aligning right now that in the back of my mind, I just, I just got to think, this is the year. This is the year it happens. Fingers crossed it happens because I am a little biased in my pick. But, I mean, it could happen. I feel like re this is realistically the best shot Marco Andretti has to win this 
win this one forsaken race in a very long time. And as a, as a fan of racing, to see an Andretti back in victory lane for the 500, uh, I can gladly say if I'm like, because I'll I know for a fact I'll be watching on Sunday. And if it happens, I will gladly say I was watching when it happened. If it happens, fingers crossed it happens. It's got a good yeah. shot. I feel like it's one in thirty-three. Ain't that with Indianapolis? It's I mean it's not it's not Daytona, but still anything can and will happen at Indianapolis. We have seen in the closest finishes is in history we've seen guys blow tires in the final lap of the race it's coming off the final corner the 500 is never decided and until it is done and there is a winner there so i'm definitely looking forward to it we have we're going to have a lot to talk about when we get back at to the studio so be sure or you tune in to kcou 88.1 fm um on friday because we will be back in studio, hopefully. Yep. Fingers crossed we'll be back in studio. Uh, I should brief our audience about this. We will be back in our studio space at KCOU 88.1 FM Columbia, the student voice of the Missouri Tigers. Uh, our first show back will be Friday, August the 28th. Uh, it will be at noon, 12 o'clock uh, Central Time is when we'll be on the air. And our show will be going out on uh, anchor.fm and uh, other streaming platforms and podcast platforms after the show is concluded. So there you go. Uh, don't forget this Friday, next Friday, August the 28th at 12 o'clock noon central time. That's when we will be back on the air until then for my co-hosts, Hallie step and Justin Palmer on behalf of them, take care of yourselves Take care of each other and please be kind to one another, both in person and online. It's a unique racing weekend. Enjoy the greatest spectacle in racing this weekend in 2020. Until next week when we are back in the studio, this is Sterling Siemens signing off.